the ways that we are looking at effectiveness as it currently stands and as it's currently developing will ultimately fail. And the reason why is because you're not asking the people who are on the ground level, who are going through the daily motions, you're not taking their feedback as a metric. You're only taking the metrics that is being observed through technology or surveys when it comes to like, you know, psychological surveys and those kinds of things. You're not taking the feedback of your soldiers seriously. And therefore, to me, you're not treating them as people. You're treating them as numbers. All right. Welcome back, guys. We got one that several of you have been asking for for a while. Drew, who are we talking to? Today, we have the one and only Michael Mellinger on board. Uh, Michael is a cognitive performance specialist. Uh, He's been around for a number of years. Uh, working as a research assistant all the way up to the director of performance psychology operations within 7th Special Forces Group. He has a master's degree in applied psychological research from Penn State University, a leadership and management certificate from the Wharton School of Business. He has his chartered psychologist status from the British Psychological Society. And he has a couple of additional accolades. He is a member of the British Psychological Society's Division of Sport and Exercise Psychology. And he holds a status as a voluntary career speaker. So Mike has been around the block. He's helped build a number of human performance focused departments at the Naval Academy. And as we mentioned with 7th Special Forces Group, uh, he's helped develop over 10 state-of-the-art human performance programs and currently serves as a subject matter expert working alongside special operations forces, first responders, and business leaders. So primarily his areas of expertise are leadership management, enhanced communication methods, team culture, key performance index tracking initiatives, and holistic human performance development. Not only is he an absolute champion in the cognitive space, he also has a high degree of interest in Olympic weightlifting. Uh, He has his level one in USA weightlifting and enjoys the finer things in life, like traveling around the globe, learning about different languages, histories, cultures, et cetera. So we wanted to bring him on because one, he has an incredible interest in obviously tactical human performance and fitness as a whole, but he sort of holds the key, so to speak, for the cognitive performance realm. And a lot of you guys have been asking for a, a cognitive focused episode for a while now. It took us some time to get there. But I think this one does a really good job of kind of setting the table, talking about the key focuses in the cognitive domain and where some of the issues might be. Um, it it may very well be part one of a longer conversation where we dig into some of that stuff. So really interested in what your guys' thoughts are and what you hear from Mike, um, some of the strategies he offers. But most importantly, I knew Mike was the right one to have this conversation with because in our very first conversation, he talked about the importance of measuring the effectiveness of the various interventions in the cognitive space. So that's kind of where we start. You'll also notice that I sound like a frog and it's because my daughter uh, started daycare. So this is just a public service announcement to all of our listeners. Wash your hands and stay away from toddlers. And both from us and any of our guests, of course, everything they express when they come on our podcast here is just their personal opinion, not reflecting their employer or any of the organizations they've been affiliated with at any point. Enjoy. Wait, wait. Okay, sorry. You're right. Okay. You're right. That was, that was awesome. I can't, I can't start the episode recorded by like calling out a dude who will. No, 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 no. <laughs> but I want, to, I want Mike to know that if it turns out you're a raging asshole, Alex, Mike <laughs> can hopefully slide in and course correct and tell you how to be a nice dude because apparently that's what cognitive performance is. <laughs> that's fair. He'll keep me on track. Yeah. Well, you ever hear the Thanksgiving analogy? Whoever is the person at the table, it's if you're wondering who it is. It's you. Oh boy. Yeah, it's probably me. But I'm not wondering. I kind of know. Okay. Lean into the skit. I like it. What? Is, so, okay. I want to start this by asking you directly. What is cognitive performance? Uh, good question. So, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> cognitive performance is, is interesting in that I don't think there's really a universal definition that everybody runs by because it's so individualistic, right? So I think of cognitive performance as more proactive And then the other sides of psychology, so like the clinical aspects of things is more like reactive. Um, So when it comes to like the cognitive piece, I mean, traditionally speaking, you'll have a definition of it's like 
goal setting and visualization, um, you know, positive thinking, mindset, visualization, all those kinds of things. And like, yes, those are all important. But then when it comes into the military aspects of things, it's not necessarily like the abstract concepts, but it's how you apply those concepts. And I think that's where the specialists come into play. And, and people who are in my field um, within the special operations community is, is we take those concepts and we tailor them to the individual and the individual needs. Um, but then the, that individual that we work with can then show us how it's mission specific so they can accomplish whatever task or goal at hand is that's, that's there. So long story short, there's really no perfect definition because it's so individualistic to the individual. Um, but I would say that it is definitely proactive. And then building off of that, it's also you know predictable in nature. We're training to be predictable with cognitive performance. So what got me excited for this particular conversation to chat with you about it is that you already knew in like our first email exchange, what the concept of MOPS and MOES was and why it was relevant in terms of having frameworks in place to measure if what we're doing works. And you used a couple of the classic kind of key words of cognitive in your explanation there. And I think everybody agrees that better emotional intelligence would be helpful or faster reaction time would be helpful or ability to operate under stress would be helpful. Where I think there's a lot of questions is what interventions actually work to produce those desired outcomes. And since it's so multifactorial, it's so hard to like isolate those things. And I'll give a classic example that like Drew and I have riffed a little bit before. I don't think on air, but like one of the proposed ways to measure the effectiveness of our cognitive performance programs is uh, like qualification rates on soldiers' primary weapon systems. And that doesn't make a ton of sense because I, if having been in units, I'm thinking that the the biggest contributors to qualification rates on soldiers' primary weapon systems is one, is their leadership getting them to the range? Two, how much ammo is available for them to practice? Because like no amount of talking about cognitive performance is going to replace time on a range to actually get better at shooting. And I've been in units before where the only time you go to the range is to qualify and then you go home and you don't do any other marksmanship stuff. I guess I'm just going to hand it over to you and let you riff for a second on how do we measure both performance and effectiveness of cognitive programs? Big question. That's a very big question. A very hard <laughs> question. Ready, go. <laughs> um, well, I guess I'll start by this is Cognitive performance is one of those things that's taken huge strides in the last couple of years. Um, and I'm, I'm proud to know that the individual who trained me to do the job that I'm trained to do with the applied aspects of cognitive, cognitive performance is one of the founders, if you will, of tactical performance, especially within the special operations community. And the essence of everything that we're trying to do, whether or not that's cognitive performance, strength conditioning, you know, physical therapy, um, you know, dietitians, you know, all we're all working towards the same goal, which is that holistic aspects of human performance. So the thing that we look at when we come to measures of human performance, measures of optimal performance, measures of effectiveness, I think it all strives from that base question, which is what is optimal human performance? So the way that I look at it is we we kind of deconstruct the question from from the back of the question. So it would be starting with performance. Performance in what? Um, if I can take a look to see, okay, if I'm measuring optimal human performance, it could be something of I'm optimizing the human being to be able to shoot, move and communicate better. It could be optimizing the human being to, you know, lose weight, gain weight, uh, lean muscle mass, whatever that is, or in the cognitive space, a little bit more so is trying to like look at memory, critical thinking, problem solving, and those kinds of things. And there's so many different types of avenues um, and different types of variables that you're looking at. So it's, it's tough for any one person to sit there and say, I know the answer to this question. You kind of have to look at the greater whole and that holistic aspects of things. So everybody's seeking that formula. Um, but to echo my, my, uh, you know, former supervisor down at, at seventh group, you know, there's no formula for optimal human performance. There, there simply isn't, um, because once we take that question, you know, going back to that is, is you look at the human aspects of things too. Am I looking at just your basic human? Cause all humans have relatively the same physiology, right? But all of our needs are different. We're all, you know, driven to do different things. We're all motivated to do different things. So if I'm trying to train to shoot better, it's going to look completely different than if I'm trying to shoot and move 
and communicate all at the same time. So when it comes to those measures of effectiveness, I'm not necessarily looking at any one variable. I'm looking at the human entity as a whole being, right? And especially in the special operations community, you have this constant, you know, uh, uh, disruptive change that you're trying to, to mitigate. Um, so the role of all the specialists within our community is trying to help them mitigate that stress, mitigate that disruptive change, prepare them for that disruptive change, and then also support them during that aspects of, of disruptive change. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to work around that steady state and, or I guess, lack of steady state rather, and that lack of consistency that everybody has. So when I look at optimal cognitive performance or human performance in general, it's how can I get that individual in that basic question to feel confident about what they're doing, have the competency to be able to go execute what it is they're executing, right? And then actually being able to come home, deconstruct it and work with me to try to figure out what we did, you know, what we can do better, uh, what we can try to help support what we can continue. Because if I train for that test, right, taking the shooting aspects of things, I can train and train and train and train for that test. And when it comes down to it, you could be the best paper shooter on the face of the planet. But then when, it, you know, the stress starts to elevate and you start falling apart, your confidence and your competency just go straight down. So there's, and, and that's a spiral that is not, there's no longer in the cognitive realm to be proactive about things. It's completely reactive. So you have to have a completely different support element to, to, to pick up that slack. Um, and the last part, I guess I'll, I'll say about it is once we can actually look at that holistic nature of that, that human being, right. And we, we make them the best we possibly can just because you're good on paper doesn't necessarily mean you as an individual have a confidence to be able to go and engage and apply what it is you've learned. So the big question that we're trying to grapple now is, okay, I have all my, my measures of performance and measures of effectiveness from higher up that I need to be able to accomplish. And it looks great. And it looks fantastic on paper. But when that soldier comes to me and they are about to deploy, they go, Hey, I'm not feeling very good, but they're performing at a higher level than they were before. They're the best person that's in their group, but their confidence is lacking. Does that make them ready or does that make them a liability to their teammates? And I think that's the really important distinction that we need to try to just try to determine. And we need to listen to the people that we're actually coaching too, not just treat them as, you know, a human vessel. How do you, because one of the hurdles that I've encountered with this space is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but when it comes to delivering those reports and those metrics to leadership from a strength and conditioning standpoint and a musculoskeletal standpoint, it's pretty black and white. Like they're injured. They're not injured. They passed the test. They didn't pass the test. But in my experience, there's a learning curve associated with even having conversations about this with leadership. Cause the example you just used confidence. Like if I went to a, a commander and said, Hey, this, this guy or this gal may not be ready because of a confidence issue. Like I see that being a, a I don't want to use the word weird. Cause that sounds bad, but like, that's going to be a weird conversation. So sure. I'm curious as to how you've kind of gotten around some of that and some of the successes you've probably seen from from working with leaders to get them to grasp why this piece of it is probably as important, if not more important than, Hey, they, you know, deadlifted the right number or whatever. Sure. Yeah. I, I'd say probably the hardest part of my job is actually explaining it to other people. Um, I think I believe it. You go through all this training, you go through all this schooling, right. And then you finally get to a location and you can actually execute your job function. And, and, you know, you come to learn that a lot of the stuff that you've, you've, you've experienced, you've learned, or you've built up all these, these years training and prepping for it. It just goes straight out the window. Um, and it's tough, right? So, and it goes into that whole communication style with leaders, right? And, and leaders change out so often, you know, every two years or so, and, and the message changes every time. And it's important to be able to try to maintain the same message, right? You know, we, we talked about the disruptive change before a leader coming in is equally disruptive change to the people that you're training. Um, so the way that I've tried to get around it is, is to try to just level with them and, and use the same approach that I use with any of the people that I train. And that's just to ask them the simple question, how are you doing today? Because that person could be super stressed out and angry just as much as any, you know, the next guy. And I know that if I need something, I'm not going to ask that person right there. And then I need to wait and I need to bide my time. I need to learn as much from them as they can learn from me and build that relationship and build that trust. 
similarly, like I've worked with a lot of leaders too, that they don't, they don't have time for that. They just say, give me an example. Why is this not going to work? Um, and you have to try to tailor a response specifically to that. Um, one leader that I ended up working with is, is prime example is, is I, I had an individual who came back from a deployment. They ended up going through everything. We trained him up. Everything looked great performing the top of his ODA. And he came up to me and said, man, I, I just, something's not right. Something's not going on. Like someone's just not clicking and I'm not feeling as if I'm, I'm in a good headspace to be able to do this deployment. And we had to sit him down and try to try to dissect what was going on. And we, we, we finally figured out what it was but he asked us specifically not to tell his leader as to what it is. And what we try to do and try to articulate to anybody we work with is like, I'm not trying to figure out what's wrong with you. I'm trying to figure out what it is that I can do to support you in any way I can. Right. And once we were able to get those barriers down and articulate that to leaders too, it's like, look, I'm not trying to take soldiers away from being able to deploy. I'm not trying to make your job more difficult. I'm trying to make you as efficient, uh, you know, as a leader, as I'm trying to make your soldiers efficient in the field. So there kind of has to be this two-way street. And once you kind of articulate it that way as, as to, you know, especially in the cognitive realm, there's, there's such a, uh, a stigma about, oh, I'm just trying to figure out what's wrong. We use a behavioral treatment style and then send you on your way. I mean, that's not what cognitive does. Cognitive tries to be proactive and get after those things and identify those things before things start to break down. So in this case, being able to articulate to a leader saying, hey, look, I'm on the same side as you. We're on the same team or we have the same goals. But at the same token, we have other people who can supplement your need. So let's wait and let's get the ODA what they need. Yes, they've been training up and doing all these kinds of things, but that's why we have integrated training with other teams as well. It's for when somebody ends up having to step off, somebody else can step in. And when that other person's ready, they go through the same process as they did before. They're not kicked off the team. They're not put on the sideline. They're just put right back into that cycle. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the easiest, well, I guess not easiest, but that is the most effective way that we've found as cognitive coaches to be able to, to make that happen. So is that the answer then? Because the, the baseline question that I think is worth addressing up front is like, what's the difference between cognitive performance and clinical behavioral health? Is the answer to that then that like, you're proactive, you're not seeking to find what's wrong, you're seeking to like move in the direct, but like, that that's a kind of fuzzy line, obviously, because that's kind of the outcome. I think a clinical behavioral health person would say they have as well is that we're like, we're not here to tell you you're broken. We're here to get you on the track to be effective again. So how do we distinguish between the two? I'd say the way that I would distinguish between the two is cognitive prepares you and preps you for the environment about what you're going to engage in. And the clinical aspects of things sees you outside of that environment to reintegrate you within your team. I'd say that was, that would be the, the primary difference between the two. Yes. Cognitive performance is proactive. You can argue that clinical is proactive too. Um, I'd say that a reactive measure and cognitive things are already in a spiral and that that person needs to be taken, taken out be because they've reacted in their environment in a way that's negative to not only themselves, but everything else around them. So if I, as a cognitive coach can help prepare them to step into that environment, you know, spiritually, mentally, physically, I've done my job. And that would be the main difference between cognitive and clinical. I'm curious about how this integrates. And you said it a number of times, the holistic aspect of it and, and getting kind of being proactive. And I would imagine that that involves a lot of integration with these other components, the strength and conditioning piece, the physical therapy piece, you know, whatever. I'm curious as to what that looks like for you at your level, because I think that that's something that a lot of folks in this space struggle with is how to one, how to define it, which I think we've already done a little bit, but then two, how do you then integrate that with these other components of holistic human performance that seem so much more clearly defined? Sure. Um, I guess there's, there's two different ways to approach that. So when I first ended up going to seventh group, my primary objective was to try to do the traditional aspects of cognitive performance. That's goal setting, breathing, um, sleeping, all those kinds of things and integrate them within like a strength and conditioning program. Um, I'd say the biggest misconception nowadays is that cognitive performance is, should be limited to just programs. And if you have more, the more programs you have, the more successful you are. Just games with gym training. Right. And, and, and it's, it's funny you say that. Cause like, I mean, even today, just 
being experienced to, uh, or experiencing somebody say, Hey, look, we want to do these, these mental performance games as kind of like a party planning event. I think it does a huge disservice to us. I mean, we spend years of, you know, our lives and our professional careers, educating ourselves and constantly adapting to this, this, this environment and this battle space that we're working within. And the way that I try to navigate it, because I, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I found within those first 12 months, I was highly unsuccessful, uh, you know, and, and then you have this, this feeling of I'm not doing what I'm supposed to be doing. <clears throat> um, you know, this, this uh, imposter syndrome that's going on. And, and what I tried to do is, is I ended up just sitting there and taking the, uh, the urban combat committee guys, uh, the cadre and sitting them down and saying, look, I don't know what I'm doing is working. How, how can I do my job better? And just being to, able to level with them and show that vulnerability and that emotional aspects of things being like, look, I care about you more than, than you probably even know. Um, like, how can I make you successful? And them sitting down and saying, well, I think that you can do this, or I think you can do that. And bringing in all these different elements into it, we learned that the most valuable piece for a cognitive coach, at least in that environment, was to embed within the ODA and go through what the ODAs were going through when it comes to that shooting, moving, communicating aspects of things, looking at whether or not, you know, certain, certain trainings need to, uh, you know, problem solve or critical think or have the reaction time or those, those processing speed things. So yes, at the core, we're still doing those cognitive elements, but we're applying them to that battle space. And that's the huge, that's the biggest difference from something that you have in a book versus something that you can actually go out and do is the, is the application. So visualization, yeah, it's a great thing to do. Your brain is, is, is wired to be able to, to look at things and, and predict them and become more predictable and become more efficient in that movement within that visualization exercise. That's great. But putting your kid on going and, and having your weapon system in front of you, moving through those movements, you know, hell, there's a couple of times where I'd blindfold people and I'd put water over their, their, their hands or, or put, you know, uh, some sort of like, uh, jelly on their hands to try to have them figure out like, okay, this is simulating blood. Well, if I blindfold a person and it feels the exact same, your brain can't distinguish between the two. So they have to go through that same exact thing. But if you know of a school, that's going to tell you to throw a bunch of, you know, lubricant on people's hands, blindfold a person and throw a bunch of water and sand on them, <laughs> then send me to that program. Cause I want to know where it is. That, that is a learn on the fly with the cadre, taking what your years of education has been, applying it to their job set, and then seeing what they can do with it. And then that shows, in essence, if you, and if the same token, they made me do it first, like if Mike can't do it, nobody can do it. It's like, you imagine the stress <laughs> going through as a cognitive coach sitting there being like, oh man, I spent eight years trying to do this and I have to actually show people I can do it. And like, oh my goodness. Um, but that's But that goes back to the environment. I think you're hitting like the nail on the head in terms of what I'm thinking about or where I want to send this next question, which is my hope is that we have at least a few cognitive performance folks listening into this and having been in the seat now for quite some time, like, and maybe you've actually done this before, just addressed kind of a room of, of relatively new folks in this space, but like from an embedded standpoint and with the successes and failures that you've had, what are, you know, I'll make up a number, like three to five things you would tell them to say, Hey, like do these things and you'll, you'll see you're, you're more likely to see success than if you just go based off the book. Cause Alex and I have this conversation all the time from a strength and conditioning perspective. I'm super curious about from a cognitive performance perspective, what that would look like. As a, that's a tough question. Cause it's a personal question. <laughs> I literally made up three to five. You can do two to eight. It doesn't matter. <laughs> So I, I guess this goes back to the root as to why it is that I'm in the field that I'm in. Um, before I start any session with anybody, whether or not that be, you know, addressing a group full of leaders or going into an ODA's team room and, and talking to them, the first words out of my mouth are, I'm, I'm here for a reason. And I'm going to tell you what those that reason is. Uh, first and foremost, no, like it's not bring your kid to work day. I mean, I'm five foot four and I look like I'm about 12 when I shave. So like <laughs> most people are like, I don't know who this guy is. So like having that emotional vulnerability and just being able to poke fun at yourself, it's the same thing on the range. It's the same thing in the shoot house. Like if you can make fun of like the things that are obvious, you're creating a sense, even if it's a false sense, you're still creating a sense of control. Uh, and that's what these guys value more than anything. At least the guys that I've worked with is, is absolute control over a situation. 
but also recognition when control is out of their hands. So once we can break that ice, the, I guess the, to, to go back to your question, the, the, the three to five things that I would look at, and, and I know you mentioned five, but I, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you five is find meaning as to what it is you're doing and why it is you're there. So in my case, uh, you know, I suffered from, from mental health down in, in, in the high school uh, times and you know, clinically diagnosed depression and suicide attempts and things like that. And I was not able to join the military and that's all I ever wanted to do. So my meaning is to be able to support and bring down those barriers or those stigmas of just because you're not feeling top notch doesn't necessarily mean that you don't provide value. And that really resonates with people because everybody's meaning is different. Yeah. Everybody has the same mission set, you know, in that, in that, at that aspect, like mission, you know, orders come down, execute these orders. Everybody has the same objective, but everybody's meaning as to why they're there is completely different. The second thing I'll say is, you know, know your limits and know your strengths. Um, you know, knowing your limitations is not a sign of weakness. I would say it's a sign of strength. It's being able to identify and articulate to your teammates yourself to say, Hey, look, I'm a little bit weaker in this area. You're stronger in this area, you know, this area, let's, let's pick this up this slack and let's be able to execute towards the same goal. It just makes you stronger as a cohesive team. And that's trusting the process, right? The last thing, and I'd say the third thing would be understanding your environment. So the ODAs that I've worked with is like, look, if you want to be successful, you have to understand the environment. You have to understand the environment that I'm working within the confines I'm working within a lot of the ODAs, like going and working with a dive team that I had never worked before, I didn't ever necessarily knew exactly how they apply to job sets, you know, versus, you know, uh, um, uh, a halo team or, you know, a direct action team, whatever that looks like. Knowing the environment that you're going to work in and knowing that battle space is going to be super, super important. Um, the fourth thing I would say was visualize. I had talked about that before. Like, see yourself or where you want to be not only within like your first person, but third person, how do you want to see other people look at you? Because if you're going to sit here and you're going to continuously just throw shade at me or ask me a bunch of challenging questions, I'll field it. I'll throw it right back at you. But at the same time, first person might feel real good. Like, Hey, you know, I've got, I've got a one up on this guy. What does this guy know? But third person, you kind of look like a jerk. Uh, and, and that's going to bring down your team culture. I'm sorry, but it's, it's, it's fact. And then the last thing I'd say is you you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable. And a lot of guys that would talk to me, they'd be like, well, of course, you know, I'm I'm 100 percent comfortable being uncomfortable. Why wouldn't I be here? It's like, okay, are you comfortable having a cognitive coach work with you? And you would be <laughs> shocked the amount of times I'd have people just go complete stone face. You know, being able to harness a stress and know how your body reacts to it heart, you know, goes within all of those five aspects. So when everything ends up falling down, you can at least rely on the meaning of why you're there and then re be, be able to rebuild yourself up as to knowing what your strengths are, your weaknesses are, the environment you're operating within, visualizing where you want to be first person and third person and trusting in that process of where you want to be. So it doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you can rely on those five aspects of things, it doesn't matter what happens. Like you'll be able to refine yourself and, and pick yourself up. So I'm going to try and get you to build on those five. Cause those, I like those, they sound like really good, like outcomes to be seeking towards and things to have in mind, but I'm hoping we can get a little bit tactical in terms of what can people do to achieve those things. Right. Sure. Cause things that come to mind in terms of like tactical tools, I mean, like the research is really good on imagery. There's lots of stuff on like motivational self-talk kind of things. Um, I've seen, like having people do cognitive challenges under various types of stress, often physical stress, fatigue, Kim's test for whatever is like the most popular thing ever, like making people remember things while they do other unrelated challenging things. What, like, what are some like tactical things either that you do with people or that like say somebody is listening to this podcast, doesn't have access to a cognitive performance specialist, but knows they want to improve their cognitive performance. What would you have sure. them go do? Um, well, I'd, I'd say go and leverage that environment aspects of things and start looking at what you have, in, you know, around you. Um, the biggest and best tool you can use honestly is yourself. Um, and I would say that any sort of things that you read or you come across is, and, and one of the questions that we would ask, especially within our urban combat course is how do we weaponize it? So it'd be like, okay, great visualization. How do I weaponize that, uh, motivation? How do I weaponize that? 
and creating some sort of meaning behind it, right? So like you had said, making it that tactical aspects of things. So part of our training processes, and I remember this isn't, this isn't a formula. There's, there's no real formula to this. Um, you know, just give you an example. One of the ODAs that I worked with is we looked at things like processing speed, reaction time, and those kinds of things. So what we tried to do, and I tried to mimic is, is putting them in, in a realistic, stressful environment that maybe things aren't going the way that they're supposed to be going. And, and we'd use all sorts of different training tools, but the idea is, is that if you're trying to train for shooting and, and training under pressure and those kinds of things, like throw a dud round in there, uh, you know, just have somebody else load your magazine, um, uh, not knowing how many rounds you have in there, being able to harness different types of, of your senses to be able to listen to things, but not, and, and feel things and, and being able to, to see things and those kinds of things. So blocking out those senses, uh, those are a couple of things we used to do. I used to end up kicking people's feet or moving people's hips, uh, you know, just kind of messing with people and doing things that you wouldn't necessarily see. And the greatest part about being a cognitive coach in, in, in my field, honestly, is what, especially when I first started is like, I never really knew exactly what was going on because it was the first time in that soft environment. Right. So I could ask all those stupid questions and start doing a lot of things that people wouldn't expect. So like, so, so a couple of people in, in would come up to me and they go, like, well, in firefights, the most common thing that happens to me is my weapon jams. It's like, okay, what's the most uncommon thing that happens to you? Uh, well, I run out of ammo because my weapon jams. Okay, cool. So when he wasn't looking and when they're already shooting, what I would do is I would actually take magazines out of their belt and they wouldn't realize it. And it's, it's funny because when you're so engaged and so hyper-focused on what it is that you're doing, all of your other senses kind of go down and you kind of become that, that, you know, that tunnel vision. So if I start like messing with things and taking things out or start putting, uh, you know, UTM rounds in for instead of and other things and, and like jamming their weapons on purpose and really throwing them for a loop, the stress and the anger that these guys go through is, is one, it's entertaining for me, but two, it's putting them through that stress to be able to say, okay, now you're experiencing something you're not experiencing. So it's just, it's work with what you have. Um, you know, do thing or, or, or get, get with somebody who doesn't necessarily know what it is your job set is and just say, Hey, distract me. Cause they're going to start doing things that you're never really exposed to. Cause they don't even know exactly what it is that you're doing or how it is you're doing it. As long as it's, you know, within a safe space, um, we would do that all the time. Um, you know, have people throw rucks on with a bunch of weight in them, um, you know, tying knots in certain areas to where they can't get gear off. You know, how are you going to be able to react to that? Um, I used to do that with people with, uh, like breaching equipment all the time as I would just tie knots on things or like put sticky tape on things and stuff like that to where it's that immediate panic of this isn't going the way that I needed it to go. What do I need to do? You need to pivot. You need to problem solve, figure it out. Similar to what I'm doing is, is taking the cognitive skills and figuring it out. It's you need to figure it out too. And once I can see exactly how you react on behavior, then I can address it because everything comes down to that behavior. Has anyone ever just turned around and punched you in the face because you pulled magazines out of their belt? <laughs> no. So it's funny. The worst, the worst thing that ever happened to me is they're like, oh yeah, the cock coach is here. Hey Mike, how about you go be our, uh, our op four and, and go dress in, in full, in full gear. And we'll, we'll just see how well you do. I was like, all right, fine. Like, that sounds good. I've never had a team of just remember I'm five, four and weigh nothing. I've never had such fear in my life of having a bunch of dudes run into a room and just one, they zip me up with UTMs. And then two, I had one guy who just came in screaming like a bear and he picked me up and he just like ran with me across the room. He's like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> so yes, there are consequences to your actions. <laughs> well, and then my follow on to that, while we're on this topic of sort of the practical stuff, are these is this something where you kind of debrief that instantaneously? Like when the guy pulls the, you know, the breaching charge and it's stuck or whatever, do you say like cut and then discuss it? Or do you wait until it's all said and done and then kind of do that debrief with everybody? Uh, well, full disclosure, I'll never mess with explosives. So That's totally fair. That. Cause that was let's another that question straight. I had was like, have you ever actually <laughs> blown yourself up? <laughs> uh, no, uh, I did learn the hard way of, of staying too close to one though. That was, that was an experience. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry. What was your question again? <laughs> now I'm thinking about breaching charges. <laughs> well, and I'm thinking about you tying knots and breaching charges, but when, when you're, when you're creating, when you're creating that hardship, that kind of like intentional hardship and 
that individual encounters that and, and the assumption would be that they react to it negatively. Do you pause the action and do the debrief just then? Or is it something that you come back to after the fact, you know, say, hey, this, 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 and this were things that I did to create that challenge. Let's talk about how you responded to that. It depends on my angle. A lot of the times when I first start working with teams, I won't tell them what my purpose is. I won't tell them why we're doing the things that we're doing because I want them to get frustrated and I want to see their behavior start to spiral in a way that they become kind of unrecognizable to themselves. I'm looking for that outburst. And the reason why I'm looking for it is because going back to the whole idea of what cognitive is, I'm looking for them to, to react in a negative way in their environment to see what their other teammates do at the same time. So then when that happens again, their behavior is more predictable in that circumstance. So the first part of your question, I guess, would be, no, I will not debrief them right away because of that strategic angle. If I will debrief them though, if we've worked together for four, five or six weeks and they continuously have that outburst and that behavior is, is negative in that way, then I'll debrief them right there and then they're on the spot and be like, what is going on? Because what is happening is, is that they're throwing the, I guess I shouldn't say that they're throwing the training out the window, but I'm saying, I guess I should say is the training that we're doing is not individualized enough to them for their comprehension, for them to be able to maintain that sense of control. Right. So we talked about, you know, having that steady state and that consistency, I'm trying to essentially disrupt that steady state, but I want them to be consistent in how they react to things, both them and their teammates. So my question is kind of two part here. One is most of the things you're talking about here are ways to like add stress or add confusion to scenarios to challenge people that are already proficient at the basics. How do you recognize when it's appropriate to add stress? And then the like part B of the question, I guess, is a ton of the assessments that we do, especially across like conventional force. People go into those assessments knowing exactly how it's going to be, exactly what the standards are. You get the opportunity to rehearse the exact thing, and there's no real added stress. Are we missing an opportunity there? Because we know they're going to have to apply these skills in stressful situations. Should we be looking towards structured assessments with elements of unpredictability in them? And sometimes that's difficult to do in a standardized way, but it seems like it might be an opportunity missed. Um. It's a good question. I, I don't really know if I have the answer to that because I, I take the stance of like testing is good, right? We we have to have testing. Um, otherwise, we're not really know what we don't really know what we're going up against. Um, but at the same time, like I don't think that you can create and granted the tests have gotten a lot better, but there's no cognitive test that I'm aware of that is being run in special operations outside of whatever the individual cognitive coach is running on their sites. And do I think it's an opportunity missed? I don't know because my guys would have been different from my colleagues, guys who, which would have been different from other individuals. But I will say that I think that we need to, to shift that mindset from training for the test of just training for the situation that arises so you can rise to that occasion. So if I induce a bunch of stress on you all the time, and then you go into a controlled shooting space or controlled testing space in an ideal world, right? Then you should be top notch, right? You should be a juggernaut and being able to rock all that stuff out. But at the same time, like we have to be able to be comfortable in a homeostasis state at the same time being comfortable in a stressful state. So I don't necessarily think it's, it's an opportunity missed if you think of it as, if I'm going to go into it with complacency, that's just as dangerous as going into it too super high stress. So I don't necessarily think it's, it's an opportunity missed. No, but I do think that there needs to be more context that shed on that aspect of training. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had people come home from being deployed and, and being downrange all the time and just being in constant contact and they get home and they have now that sense of control and that normality is back and everything's quiet and they're more stressed out than they were in a firefight. So I think that there needs to be some education on both fronts as to what is too much stress and what is too much control 
but at the same time as like, yes, a test is there, but a test is just a test. It's, it's not anything that's different. It should just be another day at the office. So it, it sounds like you're getting really close to talking about individual zone of optimal functioning stuff. Is that I've, I'm not an expert on cognitive performance at all, but I've read enough to like be dangerous, I guess, um, and make myself look stupid. You just paid a holiday last night. Oh no. <laughs> That's such an awesome prep. I'm not an expert, but I read some stuff. So stand by. <laughs> so I've I've seen like some stuff out there critical of the concept of individual zones of optimal functioning. Is is that a framework you you and like for people that haven't heard of it, it's the whole like bell curve thing. Like you need a certain amount of stress to reach like your optimal level of functioning and different people's level of optimal functioning is different, different amounts of stress. Is that a framework that you think is relevant or useful or applies? Is that something we should be talking about or is it? unproductive. I don't know. No, I, I think it's, I think it's a great talking point for people to be aware of, but being able to understand not only the optimal zone of functioning, that center of that bell curve, but the extremes on both ends, because it goes into that whole fight or flight response or, or rest or digest response is we can't continuously maintain a state of high performance because that's things will break, but at the same time, you can't maintain a state of complacency. So you have to be able to have that yin and yang of, 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 and that, that harmonious relationship between the two, you need to test your limits every now and then it's the same thing with cars, right? Like if you look at some turbocharged cars and things like that, you always have this carbon buildup. If you're continuously running it and you're not running it hard, then it's just going to build and build and build and build and build and build. And your performance is going to drop. It's the same thing with human beings. If you become complacent and you see the same things again and again and again and again and again, you're never going to get any better. You have to challenge yourself in some way, shape or form. I think that that zone of optimal functioning is a, is a prime example of what we can educate people about for them to be able to recognize what their optimal zone is and how to push themselves outside of that zone. Cause I'm not going to sit there as a cognitive coach and just say, oh yeah, the way to push a person out of their zone is to throw them in a pool and say, okay, hold your breath for as long as you possibly can. Well, if I'm working with divers, they're going to be within their op zone of optimal functioning because they're comfortable in the water. And when we're working with a person who can't swim, he's going to be on the complete opposite end of the spectrum and freaking out. He's going to drown. So like knowing your limits within that, I think is just as important as being able to know your own weapon system that you're working with. I mean, it's just, it's one in the same. It's just a different tool. What does, what does cognitive performance look like for somebody who does not shoot bad guys for a living? And maybe this gets into the leaders conversation or like the corporate and you know, whatever, but like, cause I, you know, one of the things I hear, especially now on the conventional side is like, Oh, that's great. But you know, I do this sure. or that, and it's, it's not high speed or whatever. So that may not apply to me. And I would argue that that's not the case, but I'm just curious what it looks like in your field for somebody who is not shooting, moving and communicating. Well, it's a good question. And and that's when you get into like the whole executive coaching aspects of things. Um, you get into a lot of like process planning, um, Eisenhower matrix, if you're familiar with that. Um, oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's a lot of being able to sit a person down and make them more efficient. And I think where cognitive comes into play in anything is, is being able to what, whatever those skills are, recognizing what those skills are and make them more efficient in those skills. And then also making them more predictable in their behavior with those skills. If I'm a super, super, super efficient and I get it done the exact same way, like group think is a thing. So if I bring everybody together in this, you're in your shop and have you do the same thing again and again and again and again, it's going to become redundant. You're never going to be able to problem solve and critical think and those kinds of things. I'd say cognitive coach's objective is to come into that environment and bring a bunch of different shops together to be able to figure out how to solve a, a similar solution in different ways. That's just like one example of what you can do, but when it comes to the executive aspects of things, you're right. It's very difficult for cognitive coaches. Um, at least I would say the cognitive coaches coming from the group aspect, like where I came from, I'd say it's very difficult to be able to make that, that transition similarly as it's difficult for operators to go from that pipe hitting door kicking aspects of things to that more administrative aspects of things. It's hard to make that adjustment. Um, and I'd say just working together with those individuals and identifying where their strengths and weaknesses are to figure out what, what skill sets we need to do is equally important. Honestly, like if you could bottle up eight hours of sleep and physical fitness and a pill, like we'd all be out of jobs. Um, <laughs> like that's honestly, if people in the executive environment could do those two things on a consistent way, like you're going to be much better off than, you know, just sitting in an office for eight to 10 hours, checking emails all the time. 
Well, and I'm glad you mentioned that because the reason I asked that question is Alex talked about this at the very beginning. Like, again, on the conventional side of things, from a from a top down leadership policy making perspective, a lot of the conversation around cognitive performance goes no further than are they more accurate on the range? And I think that when the only optic you have on this whole conversation is, are they shooting better? You completely eliminate everything else that might actually pertain to making someone a better human being case Mm -hmm. in point, sleeping, physical training. So it's almost like the the conversation again, from a policymaking standpoint around cognitive performance on a conventional side should be more around how do we optimize the environment, whether that's changing the PT schedule, allowing more time for sleep, adjusting the meetings, like boring, quote unquote, boring stuff. But maybe that's cognitive performance less so, oh, my dudes shot more paper targets than your dudes. Therefore, they're more cognitively enhanced. That's not really a question. That's just me on a right. soapbox, but it gets me thinking. <laughs> well, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's, it's 100% right. Is is like we, we had mentioned before is, is knowing your environment. You can equally change your environment, like you just mentioned, leveraging things to your advantage. Um, I mean, if, if I'm looking at two different individuals, if I'm looking at a high performing operator and an administrator, it's the same thing. If I'm looking at, you know, a bodybuilder versus a triathlete, I'm not going to train them the exact same way. They could be two very efficient individuals in what it is they're doing. But as soon as I flip them, like they're going to fail at what it is that they're doing. And I guess to be more specific is like, if I take a strong man, we can't, and, and a triathlete, we can't argue the fact that they're not fit right? They're very fit at what they do. But then if I take a triathlete and say, Hey, I want you to go carry this stone or a strong man and say, Hey, I want you to go swim 10 miles. Like (laughs) they're going to fail at what they're doing, but they're still high performing fit individuals. So when we come to the, when it comes to the performance aspects of things, what we need to be asking ourselves is not like, not what the end result is that you want necessarily like right away, but the overarching 30,000 foot view of what it is you're envisioning. If you're envisioning a bunch of paper shooters, great, we can make that happen. But if you're envisioning uh, individuals who are super efficient at being able to shoot, but at the same time, you're looking at individuals who are super efficient at being able to push out information to those people who are going to go out there and shoot. Now we're talking. Now we can actually get into the nitty gritty as to how we can figure out what it is like resource wise, we need to leverage to make that happen. So I want to do like a brief aside because you triggered something I was thinking about. And it goes back to your like five things that you addressed at the beginning. Uh, your, your number three of the five was understand your environment. And you guys just threw around the word fit a little bit and talking about comparing strong man to triathlete and what is fitness. This is nerdy, but it's important to remind people like where the word fitness came from and what it actually means. And like, when we say the phrase survival of the fittest, it doesn't mean that like the most jacked will survive. It doesn't mean the highest VO2 max will survive. It means the most suitable to their environment will survive. Like we're talking about beak shapes on birds and where they get their food and stuff like that. When we say survival of the fittest, it's not who does the best in the gym. So when you talk about knowing your environment, fitness doesn't exist without the context of the environment. And I think that's really appropriate because you're talking about cognitive performance that to an even greater degree, can't really be defined without having a conversation about what are the ways in which it will be tested. I agree. If you can't define that, you can't explain performance. But wouldn't you agree that a more jacked bird is more (laughs) likely to survive than a less jacked bird? I mean, I would just, I don't know. That's a rabbit hole, but I would argue that I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so I do the, fly from North Pole to South Pole. Might exactly. Have Wait, an African <laughs> swallow or European swallow? Um, <laughs> Monty Python and the Holy Grail. If you haven't seen that, thanks for play. explaining, Drew. Yep, of course. But no, because you teed up the question that I was going to ask after the conversation we just had, which is like, how do you? how do you show a return on investment for this stuff? Like the example you used earlier about a guy who was suffering from, or not suffering, but you know, low confidence, low confidence. Like as a strength coach, I can objectively show you that I have increased your back squat or whatever. And, and as a, as a PT or an AT, I can show you that your ACL is no longer torn, but like, how do you, how do you show that? Or is it just a completely different conversation than, metrics and before and afters and red, yellow, greens. So I'm going to give you two answers. I'm going to give you my personal personal answer and the professional answer. 
the professional answer is exactly what you just said, metrics. Can I show that you're sleeping better? Can I show that uh, HRV is a new big top, hot topic nowadays? Can I show that your reaction time is faster? Can I show your processing speed is faster? Those are all the metrics that you can look at, right? Which are great. They have a purpose. But from a personal standpoint, and going back to what I had mentioned before is, personally, I am looking for an individual who comes to me and says, I feel better. My skills, or at least my, my job skills, feel as if they've enhanced. I'm getting into less trouble. I feel more competent in what I'm doing. I feel more confident in going out and doing those tasks. And you as a coach have helped me. And I want to continue to work with you. And they continuously come back to me. That is in essence success to me because it goes to show confidence and competence reduces anxiety. If I'm reducing your anxiety, I'm improving your performance. It doesn't matter what that performance is. It could be a performance as a human being, just being able to sleep more efficiently. Your anxiety is lower. Your sleep is most likely going to improve. If I'm reducing your anxiety and your shooting scores go up, fantastic. I'm inadvertently being able to influence your performance in some way, shape, or form. If I immediately go after the metrics and I go after those tests, I can make you the best test taker on the planet, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have a confidence and a sense of competency to be able to execute your job function. I think that is the biggest disservice to our field. And I honestly think that is the biggest liability when it comes to training individuals is to train them specifically for a test just to get through. Because when it comes down to it, like tests have a purpose but you're not going to be going and executing a test in the middle of, you know, downrange on, on, on a fire, you know, in a firefight or, you know, in, in a, in a fob or whatever that is doing administrative tasks, sitting on an airplane, sitting on a helicopter. You're not just going to be sitting there and doing a bunch of deadlifts all the time. I need you to be able to execute those functions outside of just that test. I'll ask this because it's a chance to like rehash a topic that we try and hammer home with people all the time. Are you familiar with Goodhart's law? Cause you just got really close to discussing it. I'm not familiar with that. No, it's one of our favorites. So like Goodhart's, <laughs> it, it is a recurring theme on the podcast, but Goodhart's law is when the measurement becomes the goal, it ceases to be a good measurement. Like if you, mm. if you are training to the test, like for like, it's always easiest for us to use strength and conditioning examples, right? Like if like, deadlift might correlate with certain things or the number of push-ups you can do might correlate with certain things. But when people start training because they want a heavier deadlift and want to be able to do more push-ups, it kind of decouples that thing from what it was supposed to be predictive of in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I can absolutely see how that might be just as big a problem or worse in the cognitive space. And I, frankly, I worry about this. I just saw news articles the last few days that the the army has decided to move forward with its future soldier prep course which we did an episode on a while back because of the initial successes and my immediate thought was like wait a minute how do we even know if it was successful yet are we measuring performance or are we measuring effectiveness because the the one they talked most about in the article was saying that like people showed up because they couldn't score highly enough on the asvab and so they put them in a classroom for a while and they teach them how to take the asvab better I don't know exactly what goes on in that classroom. Probably some awesome stuff goes on, but one element that goes on is teaching take a lot them how of to take the, you take you learn how to take the test better. Mm -hmm. And if if we're saying the test is a good predictor of aptitude on a bunch of things, but then we're teaching them how to take the test, we're not actually giving them aptitude at those things. We have like ruined the ability of the test to do what it was designed to do in the first place. And now we really have to ask ourselves, did we put this program in place? to turn slides green or did we put this program in place to improve people's performance and i don't think we have anything yet to say they perform better all we know is that they passed the threshold they needed to pass and we were able to slam them into basic training because that was the point in the first place and i think you're you're touching on that with the taking tests thing just because you made it objective and quantifiable doesn't mean it's more valid yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, the effectiveness is, is that was the topic that kept me up at night when I was at, at group is because we were being asked to design what measures of effectiveness were. Uh, I mean, in essence, my colleagues and I were, who were, were there at the time, were trying to 
tell the army how to be, you know, how to, to look at a cognitive coach and say that we're effective. And we didn't have an answer because at the end of the day, like you have a bunch of clinical instruments you can use. Great. But like, I'm not going to throw a person in a clinical instrument, like the neurobehavioral symptom inventory checklist, like, cool. You scored 30. And the next time I saw you, you scored 20. Was that because you don't have a hangover and you scored less on your headache score versus like, or did this, did I influence something like the effectiveness aspect of things is, is such a controversial topic. And one that I don't think that we will ever find an answer that satisfies everybody's desire to find that outcome. Do you find that that is a concept that leaders can understand or do you find that that is something that creates a lot of friction or tension? I mean, I'll be honest with you. I, I don't have that conversation with anybody higher up because I, I don't like personally, I don't like hearing the excuses, but at the same time, like I also don't know what's going on on that higher up level. When I was in the position I was and, and position I still am, I tell people all the time, like I'm here to serve as kind of like a buffer, kind of like a shield between you and the higher ups who are telling you what to do in some way, shape or form, at least as an, in, like, to be an influence. The measures of effectiveness conversation is such a controversial one to where I, as a coach will stand by every single day and fight tooth and nail to say, the ways that we are looking at effectiveness as it currently stands and as it's currently developing will ultimately fail. And the reason why is because you're not asking the people who are on the ground level, who are going through the daily motions, you're not taking their feedback as a metric. You're only taking the metrics that is being observed through technology or surveys when it comes to like, you know, psychological surveys and those kinds of things. You're not taking the feedback of your soldiers seriously. And therefore to me, you're not treating them as people, you're treating them as numbers. And as soon as we get away from, you know, treating them as people, treating them as human beings, now we have your disconnect. I'm training a human being. I'm training a person who's a father, who's a brother or a mother or a sister or whoever that is. I'm training that person to be the absolute best that they can be. I'm not training a number to make your metrics look good. And I will never do that because as soon as I do, my credibility goes straight out the window to the people who I'm trying to serve. And then at the same token, they will not want anything to do with me. And guess what? Your metrics, they're gone. The only reason why you're getting metrics is because you have cognitive performance specialists who have been in this environment for a long period of time, who understand the aspect of training a human being, not training a number. So this echoes something that comes up constantly in conversations we have. The, the classic line from senior leaders or from whoever is that if I go to a commander and ask them the status of their trucks, they can give me a clear answer on like what state each truck is in and when the fix is coming sure. and whatever. And if I go and ask them about their people, they don't have a clear answer for that. And there is a deep like knee-jerk reaction kind of thing embedded in senior leaders to want a slide that tells them the status of the people and like knows when the parts are in order to fix the problems. And I, I don't know how we have better conversations to explain that that's not necessarily like, I think you have the wrong goal. I think as long as that is your goal, you're going to overlook like the nature of working with people and the way leadership works and how all this stuff factors in You're you're echoing a lot of the same sentiment here. So I appreciate it coming back up. It's, it's always great when some of these themes are consistent across domains and types of professionals and things like that. Sure. Absolutely. I mean, maybe that's how we measure success is once motor pool Monday requires a cognitive performance specialist for a Humvee because leadership doesn't understand how to engage with machines. They're so fluent. <laughs> in the language of human behavior. Maybe that that's the world we should strive for. <laughs> I'd argue if all of your equipment's breaking down, you should take a look at the sleep of your people and see if it's being reduced because you're overworking them. I will say it's I've, I don't think I've taken a second to shout this out on the podcast before. Uh, a lot of stuff like hinges around the, like the infantryman being like the point of the spear, like whatever the combat element is, but having spent a lot of time in infantry units, 
the mechanics seems to be the ones working the hardest and the longest, and they never got any attention for it because it was easy for like the unit to come back from the field and be like, oh, you guys killed it out there. Like awesome sticks lanes, take a four day. And then we'd all be happy and we'd like head out on our four day. And then I'd notice that the mechanics were just walking straight back to the bay to keep fixing stuff. And this has nothing to do with cognitive performance, but I think you're <laughs> right about like noticing that like the problem isn't the problem. The problem is an indicator of where the real problem is. And a lot of those real problems are human, which like I, the version of that I usually say is that Drew mentioned it earlier in the podcast, the physical domain is really easy to quantify. Like you can tell like whether somebody's injured or not. You can tell somebody whether they passed their test or not. You can tell somebody what their one rep max is, all that kind of stuff. But when there are problems in the physical domain, we always assume that the fix is in the physical domain. Like this guy's struggling on the PT test. We need to make him do more PT. Cool. But in, in my limited but decent experience, most of the time when there is a problem in the physical domain, it's a symptom of a problem in a different domain that often has a cognitive element in terms of what is going on with this person's environment. What is going on with this person's control or lack of control? And like, it just happens to be manifesting in some sort of physical struggle, whether it's weight gain, weight loss, performance decrement, whatever. Yeah. I mean, and that's, I think that's what makes it so powerful as a, as a group is, is being able to look at that holistic aspect of training. I mean, there's a lot of, of resources that are out there that are very pillared. It's the unfortunate truth, but when you find a team that can work that holistic way, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've worked with strength coaches who will sit there and say, Hey, I mean, I've got this top performer. He's just not doing well. Like what's going on and, and taking into account all the science behind, you know, the physiology as to maybe why that is. And then having that simple conversation of just being like, Hey, go talk to Mike, what's going on. And then sure enough, I find out there's something going on at home or, uh, you know, maybe something was said in a team room that just really resonated with them and that they're just not feeling it. Um, but being able to go to that strength coach and say, Hey, look, just give them a couple hours, have them come back for that next hour. And then they'll be good to go. I mean, that's, that's the power of being able to look at a person and train them. And that, that physically, mentally, and spiritually aspect of things is you will become a very powerful force to be reckoned with. If, if you can have that support element, you mentioned the mechanics before is you're only as power as strong as your support element or element. And it's the same thing with your contractors as well. I mean, your training aspects of things, a lot of it is, is, is built on the backs of contractors or you know, and those contractors, all, you also have family is like, they're not the second class citizens or third class citizens, right? It's, is we need to take a look at the holistic nature of everybody, not just the coaches, but not just the soldiers, but the support elements, the family elements that are behind that too. I mean, you have MFlex now who are, are really great people to work with. I've worked with them personally too. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a really interesting way that this has been developing over the years. I think one thing that stood out to me, it, it came kind of as a surprise and it definitely came from our cognitive folks, but the, they had like early on recommended team building as part of the programming we offer. And it seems cheesy to me at the time. It's, and it's like the classic team building, thing, like building towers out of spaghetti and marshmallows or like, <laughs> like having a list of note card questions that start out really casual and get really serious, like classic. I mean, like everybody's seen the one where you like try and move the, the hoop together, but everybody, keeps oh, on yeah. moving it up. Like, like all the classic little team building. We're a team things. now. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or like balancing everybody on the same. We wall, built a marshmallow tower based off our birthdays blindfolded. But all that stuff seemed extremely cheesy to me at the beginning. And it over the course of like a few iterations of working with people and seeing how the stuff plays out, it ended up seeming to me like it was the most valuable thing we were doing. And not only that, we we usually did it like amongst human performance team human performance teams to do that holistic stuff you were talking about, break mm -hmm. down the pillars, get people talking to each other. But in a lot of places, it has become an offering that the cognitive performance folks do. Like, hey, bring in your leadership team. We will do team building exercises for you. Or hey, bring in your squad. We will do team building exercises with the squad. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to quantify, right? I don't have a, a quantitative assessment I can do on like the team cohesion of whoever, but as far as I can tell, it's a, it's a huge value add 
for the organization. People might think of it as cheesy and like, oh, like we go to the field together. We don't need team building exercises. Mm -hmm. Have you tried it? You might get a ton out of it. I don't know what your experience with that is, but it's, it has demonstrated value where I've seen it used. Yeah. Team building is a really really valuable thing and it can be anything. I mean, I, I love the tower builds. Those are always just fun to watch and observe. But like, like we had talked about before is, is group think is a thing, like bring in leaders from different shops and have them come together and solve the same problem. Um, even something as simple for a team building thing would be like super controversial is you sit there and you go, who here likes Oreos versus chips Ahoy. Okay. Now debate as to why they're good and why they're bad. Um, and it's just like one of those things where at like during the event, you don't necessarily think about it as something that's applicable to your job function, but then you really quickly figure out how people one problem solve, but also to communicate, which I think is the number one thing that we're looking at now, at least that I'm looking at now is, is the way that people communicate with one another and, and attain information, uh, retain information, uh, and then being able to like put that information out is actually really interesting. If you ever want to have a really fun time, you should play telephone and just start adding more and more and more people and then watch how the different ac acronyms change, but also watch how the different um, cultures start to play into those because you're going to start to have not only like cultures of where you're growing up, but the cultures that's with like the subcultures within the unit and the organization you're with. It's, it's fascinating to watch people who are like sappers, then they end up working with infantrymen and then they work with like a, a GS who's been there for 25 years and who actually would arguably know more than anybody else in the room and just hearing the different language and terminology used. And by the end of that telephone, nobody has any idea what the original message was. <laughs> I'm curious about the Chips Ahoy versus Oreo and which, uh, which one wins out. Are there people that prefer Chips Ahoy over Oreo? I was going to say, if you do, you're a psycho. <laughs> the, the, the number one activity I use I still use this is um, going off the chips Ahoy and, and Oreos. I used to use that one a lot. And then somebody actually recommended this to me is um, goldfish or Cheez-Its. Oh man. Now, now that's a more fair, I can see arguments on either side of that one. Mm -hmm. Because then, then you get into like, well, what kind of Cheez-Its are they the extra toasty Cheez-Its? Are they the Parmesan Cheez-Its? And then you get on the different other aspects of like the goldfish. I, I will never forget. I had 60 minutes to this presentation. Sorry, I'm going off on tangent. No, please, because I'm we got out of goldfish. <laughs> <laughs> we got out of there after like two hours, and they had put every single flavor of they could think of when it comes to Cheez Its and goldfish, matched them up as to their nearest competitors, and figured out which one won out. Well, that that I I can't tell you who won because it's <laughs> confidential. closed, safe space, confidential. <laughs> Um, and I can't adv advocate for either one of those. I like them both. Yeah, we're sponsored by opinion. broccoli. <laughs> yeah, shout out goldfish. <laughs> shout out cheese. It's shut up. <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My I'm sorry. The dietitians that I work with. Um, <laughs> but it is. It's just those simple things, man. They're, it's just so funny to watch. Well, I was gonna say I I've asked this question before as kind of a closer. It's been a while, but I'm curious because no pressure. You're basically serving as the mouthpiece for the cognitive performance uh, industry right now. Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> what is, what is like speaking to coach again, coaches, athletes, just anybody leadership that might tune into this. Like what is one thing you'd want to get across as to what, what cognitive performance is and can provide to an organization? Like what's the elevator pitch for it? That's super tough. No pressure. Right. I would say that cognitive performance stands as your gateway to the individual that you're working with and is the answer to how to make humans the best that they can be at what it is they're doing. And the reason why I say that, and it goes back to my original supervisor at seventh group is for me anyway, it starts with the question at the door, how are you doing today? Anybody can ask it. You don't need to be a cognitive performance coach to, to, to do it. But it doesn't matter if you're a strength coach. It doesn't matter if you're a cognitive coach, a dietitian, whatever it is, that question opens up an opportunity and a window to see inside of the person that you're working with in that moment, the headspace that they're in, the direction that they want to go, and the tools and resources that you have at your disposal to be able to, to get them to where they need to be. So in essence, 
you can say that the gateway is strength and conditioning coaches because they're the ones that they confide in, you know, the most great, but still, if you, if you look at it as a nutshell, asking that person how they're doing, that is a cognitively driven and cognitively focused question. Cause you're asking specifically about their behavior, their direction, their steady state, their mindset, whatever it is that you want to think of it's individual to that person. I've got a couple, I've got a couple like shorter Q and a kind of questions. First one, this might seem dumb. I don't know. <laughs> Whiteboards, like being able to click as lights come on, on a board. Is that oh. a relevant training or testing modality? What's, where does that fit? I love those boards. They're fantastic. There's a lot of different softwares and stuff. And like I said, I, I won't name any of those softwares and I'm not advocating for that software. It's my personal opinion. So if you want to touch base with me offline, I can give you a couple of pieces of advice. We're sponsored but, by all of them. It's fine. <laughs> the light, light boards are a great, great technique to use for sure. Okay, cool. One I have seen and I, I've seen, and this will hopefully have like an episode down the road where we talk about how do we apply this in reserve component type situations, but one I have seen applied in the reserve component that seems very cognitive. It wasn't necessarily labeled cognitive, but teaching leaders motivational interviewing, um, basically teaching them to do better counseling of their subordinates, teaching them to like draw out some of the elements of that person's environment and that person's sense of control that are necessary for their performance to be better. Is that a tool you've ever used? Cause I'm really, I think, I think it's a big piece of the way ahead as we work towards some of this, like whether it's reserve, whether it's non-combat units, just like teaching some of those baseline skills of human communication for leaders kind of stuff. 100% doing some sort of communication training or style is, is, is important. Um, there's a lot of, uh, organizational psychs that I'm aware of that I've worked with also that, that do a fantastic job. They use things like the disc, uh, and the Hogan and things like that. But, and, and they, they give a really good perspective as to like where that person is in communication style, but then at the same token, like taking that cognitive aspect and figuring out how to apply it. I do that all the time, ton of success with it, both for trainees, um, you know, 20 year veterans, NCOs, it doesn't matter who it is, just having the, the you know, means to communicate, especially in today's environment is super important. And then. The last quick one, and this is circling back to something we mentioned before Drew hit record earlier, scope of practice stuff between different kinds of professionals. One that one that's asked all the time for the army in particular is that we like there is a contracted card performance specialist on the team. Whether you should call that person a sports psych or not has lots of room for debate on what that role is. But then leading the cognitive effort we have occupational therapists mm. and like, have you run into this question? Has it something, been something you talked about? Because I think there's some, like, I think it creates a little bit of confusion potentially in terms of what belongs in the cognitive pillar. And some OTs seem very, very, very proficient in it. And it's what they're really interested in doing. It's why they work in a performance realm. And others are like, wait a second. I thought I was like the wrist, elbow, shoulder guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> good question. It's, it's one of those things that's kind of come, come up in the last several months or so, at least to, to my knowledge in the last several months or so. Funny enough, I was actually asked to go and train, um, one of the H2F, uh, groups and all of their OTs on cognitive performance because their OTs didn't feel confident in doing it. The only reason why I say that is because I think if you want a true expert, like subject matter expert in cognitive performance, then you need to have a person who is, has a, a pretty heavy background in the applied um, aspects of, of whether that's sports psychology, organizational psychology, and, and those kinds of things and being able to meld it together. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to take away from their profession. Their profession is very good. It's not something that I would ever feel like I could do. So on the flip side, like, do you really feel as if you could do what I do? Is, is kind of like the blunt question because anybody can pick up a book and read it and it's great to educate yourself on it, but then it's the applied aspect of things. Like I can pick up a book and read about how, you know, how to shoot better, but until I actually engage in that, that activity, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm a subject matter expert in it. I don't kind of a controversial topic and I'll probably end up making a lot of enemies that way, but I don't think that OT should be taking the role of cognitive performance specialist. If I need to take a stand, that's my stand. 
there's there's a whole conversation here. We don't have time to do it in this episode. And most of our listeners probably think we're getting really semantic here anyway. But I do think as as I've learned about their role and their profession and things like that, a lot of what you're saying does echo in a lot of what they talk about. Um, the like one of the core, well, I think there are different schools of thought in the OT world, but one of them is the person environment occupation performance model of thinking about it. And when you start talking about those things and, and like the phrases you used were like, know your weaknesses, find meaning and purpose, understand your environment, some self-awareness stuff, first and third person, like harnessing stress, like all of those sound very much like things an occupational therapist would work with someone on as long as they're comfortable with like the cognitive piece of occupation. Cause like it all comes back to how you define occupation and what that means and stuff. But I think there's, there's room here for conversation. I think this is kind of endemic to the whole human performance world. And this is why we end up with like stovepipe pillars where people draw boundaries between what they do and stick to their camp because they get frustrated with somebody else's slightly different perspective on the same issues and I think a goal here has got to be how do we find ways to to collaborate between these domains and like do better assessments of what services different organizations need. Because I think it's obviously going to be different between different mission sets and different organization sizes and things like that. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. I mean, they're, they are experts in their own field and they're more than capable of, of taking on that role. The only question that I would ask is who made that determination? I have an interest in strength and conditioning and I'm USA, you know, W level one certified, but I'm by no means a strength and conditioning specialist. I don't know. And like you said, it, it, it's much deeper than that. And that's a conversation. I would love to sit down with an OT and just hash it out and in like a constructive way. I mean, I'm one of those people who I just, I love throwing questions and being argumentative and challenging. Um, you're in the right goes, place. Yeah. I think it was the applied aspect of things. Um, but yeah, I, I would love to hash it out with, with somebody like that. Last question, because this is like our go-to closer. And you touched on this a little bit when you said that you were like, if you were going to make a stand, that's the stand. So again, as the mouthpiece for the cognitive performance uh, so industry much pressure. <laughs> as, a, as a whole, uh, if you had the the metaphorical keys to the kingdom, so to speak, what is what is one thing you would change about tactical cognitive performance? Not five this time, you just get one. What is one thing that I would change? Listen to your cognitive coaches. <laughs> and that goes, and that's not for the ODAs. Leaders, listen to your cognitive coaches. It's the perfect closer. Mike, thank you so much for coming on. This has been, I think this is going to be, I think people are going to really enjoy this conversation. I know we'll get questions and feedback on this one, guaranteed. Perfect. We'll bring Mike back on. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. Yeah, any any questions, I'd, I'd love to, to come back and hash it out. I love controversy. Perfect. So do we. Hey, guys. It's Alex. Hope you liked the episode. If you found it useful or enjoyed the conversation, please give us a rate and review on whatever platform you listen on. And we'd also appreciate if you're on Instagram, follow on the page. And if you want to reach out, DMs are always good, or you can email us at mopsandmoes at gmail.com. That's M O P S N M O E S at gmail.com. See you next week.